There's a global pandemic. A client comes to you, they need a website now, they need to get the information out to the public as soon as possible. But there's budget and time restraints. The website that you give them is not going to be everything that they're looking for. How do you balance expectations, form, and function to deliver for your client? Today, we're talking about more than an MVP. Dramatic pause. Sorry, that <laughs> thing. Um, there's always a bit more pressure when you present when the CEO of your company is sitting in the front row. <laughs> hey, Sam. Are you here for the UX or to make sure we don't drag the company into a dispute? <laughs> <laughs> Hello, I'm James, this is Pete. Um, we are both originally not from New Zealand. We chose Immigrant Song by Led Zeppelin because of that, you can probably tell by our accents. Uh, I moved over to New Zealand in 2009. Um, I've been with Silver Stripe for about six years where I'm currently creative director. Yeah, and it's James Winsor, I'm Pete. Um, I've also from the UK and I've been here for about 12 years and I lead the strategy and delivery teams at Silver Stripe. Now, one of the fun things when you're doing a presentation with someone else, you have to agree on what slides you're going to use. And we had a lot of back and forth about what picture we'd put up of ourselves. We went back and forth with, do we put baby photos up? Do we put our professional headshots up? And then we came across this picture, which was taken a year ago, and we both remarked how much long, younger we look <laughs> than we do now, um, which maybe says a lot for the work that we've done over the last year. We wanted to just talk a little bit about where we're from and what we do, because um, you might be thinking, why are these guys up here talking about MVPs? Aren't Silver Stripe that CMS product company in Wellington? Well, that is true. We are a CMS open source product company, but we're also a full service digital agency. And we've been around for 20 years, and we have our offices in Wellington and Auckland. And back in 2008, we, um, we had some interesting projects. And we started in 2008, and we developed a website for this guy. Um, for the DNC um, Democratic campaign. And the story goes at Silver Stripe that he didn't actually know they had picked a Kiwi company till the first time they spoke to us on Skype, and we all sounded very different. Um, I don't know if that's a true story, it's the one that goes around, but we think it's a good story, so we'll leave it there. Um, when we thought about it, when me and James were thinking about what could we talk about, we sort of thought, well, over the last 10 years, Silver Stripe's done heaps of projects for lots of clients. We've probably built thousands of websites, small and large, maybe not thousands, maybe hundreds of websites <laughs> for clients. And we thought there's a lot of shared experiences that we thought we could bring and talk about today. So what we're going to do is we're going to start talking about MP MVPs and what that means to us and what some practical examples hopefully you can take from that. So without further, further ado, let's dive into it. James. Thanks, Pete. So what does MVP mean? In this context, it does not mean most valuable player. <laughs> it means minimal viable product. So that's the minimum that you or your client is happy to go live with, with the idea that there might be some things that you add on a bit later. An MVP is often necessary, but don't leave it there. That's what we're talking about today. So it may be necessary, as I mentioned, about time, budget restraints. Um, once it's live, the excitement's done, people are busy with other things, it's very easy to leave it there, like it's doing its job, but it's always necessary to keep iterating, um, keep testing and validating. Uh, so, You've probably seen the diagram in, in this form before. It's, what we're talking about here is, is lean UX. So think, make, check, and repeat. Uh, and what we're talking about today is three clients that we've worked with over the past year. All government, all needed websites, um, MVPs win four weeks, uh, but they all, were, they all had the mindset that they wanted more than that and to, to continue iterating. So here's the talk timeline. All these clients, uh, as I said, are government and they're somehow interlinked by the pandemic. You all know Unite Against COVID-19 by now. In May, we started work on Keep It Real Online, which is a website for keeping kids safe on the internet. And then in September, we started work on Connected, which is an initiative for um, helping Kiwis get back to work. So what does MVP mean to us? Whenever we produce an MVP, there's, there's five core things that we aim to, to put in that MVP. Intuitive UX, it's got to be easy to use, easy to navigate. Lightweight functionality, uh, you don't want to be putting API layers in there, complex forms, it's got to be lightweight, good to go. On-brand design, be that with um, logo, fonts, typography, graphics, whatever, it's got, to, it's got to be representative of the brand. And it varies the level of accessibility per website, but for all of these government sites, we made sure that it was AA compliant. 
and easily extendable. So at Silverstripe, um, we design and build what we call content blocks. I'm sure most of you have, have heard of that term before, but it's designed slices of templated content that can be reused on a page and reused across multiple pages within the site. So it makes it really easy to extend what you've already built. And a lot of this work that we do involves client collaboration, which is Peter's going to talk about. Yeah, and I think when you think about how we work with clients, so this could be, you know, in our, our sense, we're an agency, so we work with external clients. You may work for a government department or an organization, so you have an internal client or product owner, and how you work with them is really important to the success of an MVP. An MVP is generally a subset of features, maybe in a compressed timeline. So there's a few things that we've learned that we felt are really valuable, and there's sort of three tiers to that that we want to talk about. The first one is around communication. So it's really important to have communication right and nail it. And that's not just at the start of a project. I'm sure you've all been there and you start off something, everybody's really excited, you get together, you do your workshops, you plan out what happens, and then the project goes along and you get further and further down, maybe more people get involved, the development team gets involved, the testers, the change managers, whoever it might be. But having the communication and the shared language during the project is super important because it just means that what you're trying to achieve transcends throughout the entire project. The next element is relationship. And a relationship is super important because as you navigate a project, there will be times where you have tough conversations and you need to build the rapport with your clients and develop the trust. And trust, if I think about clients that I've worked with, I've got a really different relationship with clients that I've worked with for five years to ones that are more recent. Because trust is something that you develop over time but it's a really important element of the success because it allows you to have those honest conversations. And the final point is around the tooling. So these are the tools that we use to achieve this. And this is simple things around, you know, how are you tracking your MVP? How are you tracking your requirements? And it doesn't matter if you're using a Jira product, you're using Monday.com, you're using a, some post-it notes on a board, just having a shared way of understanding and tracking the work that you do. And I think this year as well, we've all learned to work really differently. So, you know, we do a lot more things remotely now, but also recognizing when it's important to bring people together and have those collaboration sessions, because um, it helps build that trust, helps build that communication and um, drive towards the outcomes. So we're going to talk, as James mentioned, about three clients today um, and how we define their MVP. And we've called this sort of MVP Plus, and we've broken it into sort of three areas of the delivery. The first one is early delivery. And this is when something's needed quick in the market fast. The second is around fast follow. So again, something's been delivered and you're doing some work immediately thereafter. And then the final one is continuously improving. Again, needed in the market quickly, but you've got a longer period of time to refine and improve the work that you're doing. So the first example we're going to talk around is early delivery, or another way of phrasing it, fast delivery. So this is speed is off the essence, go, 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 go. You need something out, you need to get it done now. Um, you might be doing ongoing releases, really small feedback cycles, um, but all about speed. And for this, we're going to talk around our work with Unite Against COVID-19. Now, before we get into the design side of it, which I'll let James talk about, because I shouldn't really talk about um, design, um, we wanted to share a little bit about the origin story of the project. So at the start of the year, COVID-19 around the world was becoming more of an issue. And it was starting to hit New Zealand. It hadn't really been affected by it too much yet. And the government had developed this brand, which you'll all be familiar with through an agency. And they'd stood up a very basic informational website um, to give people, keep people informed. Now, I'll we'll remember the Prime Minister's address when they announced the new alert levels. And then they sort of realized, well, we're going to actually have to change how we communicate with people in New Zealand. So there's a few things we got involved with as part of that. One was making sure the site was secure, you know, making sure it's performant, can handle the load. Everybody in New Zealand was visiting it, and everybody in New Zealand was visiting it generally at the same time every day. If you ever look at the graphs, it's like this, and then at one o'clock it was like this, and then back down again, and then at five o'clock it was back like this. So we had to make sure the site could cope with that. So that needed to happen. But there was also the comm strategy. There was a lot of information that the government wanted to get out to New Zealanders. And they didn't always know up front what that information was going to be. So we had to work with the government to work out what that was going to be. So James and I got the call and said, hey, you know, you've got the site, it's all hosted now. Can you come and chat to us about the work that we need to get done? So yep, we went down there. And this was the day before level four. 
Um, so Sam, Sam didn't want us to go down. He was no, very Sam worried didn't want about us. To go down there. Um, <laughs> we got some special forms cleared from the government to head into town. Um, so we went down there and we met and we discussed the brief. Um, and we looked at the work and James thought we probably thought, you know, traditionally this would take us maybe six weeks to deliver what they wanted. And they said, you've got two. And we were like, right, okay, so we've got two weeks to do six weeks worth of work. So me and James went, James went back and said, look at this, see, this is a lot of work to get done. So then we thought, right, we need to think about how we're going to approach this. So we sort of broke the work down into, I guess, two tiers. One being the immediate work that just needed done now, within days. And then ongoing development, work that could be released over that time period. So aside from the work that James had to do on the design, which he'll talk about, we had to approach the development of that a little bit differently. So we think about what we call our development story. Now, I'm sure some of you may have worked on an agile project before or any other delivery project, and they go through a normal cycle of, you know, you do your daily stand-up, you might do some sprint planning, backlog refinement, and you rinse and repeat. It's got a steady cycle. Now, sometimes you need to throw all that out the window and take a different approach, and we had to do that a little bit with this. Now, by now, you might be wondering why I put a picture of three feet and one person behind me on the screen. Well, this picture was taken at 1.30 in the morning after one of many late-night deployments. So I thought I'd just share a little bit with you what a day in the life of the development team was like and the design team on how you would approach delivering six weeks of work in two weeks. So part of it was making sure we had enough horsepower to really get the work done. So we had to have enough people to deliver the project, but there's only so many people you can have working on code at one time. You can't put 50 people on it. There is a limit to what you can do there. So we'd start the day in the morning with a stand-up. We would work out with the client what we're going to achieve that day. James would work directly with the client and the government to work out on the designs for that day. So we'd actually do that in tandem. So you, know, you might be familiar, you might do a wireframe, send it off, get feedback, do visual design, send it back, do some iterations. We were compressing this and doing this in tandem all over Zoom. Likewise, we'd onboard the development team, and the design and the development team would work in tandem. So they would actually be working together as they were coding it to get the features out. And at the end of the day, we would get together with the client and work out what needed to be released that evening. Now, one of the challenges is you can design and build things really quickly, but you don't want the site to break. You know, you have to make sure you still follow the best practice. So at night, the team would do all their work, and when the site traffic was low, we would deploy the code, do all the good smoke testing to make sure the site was up and stable. So as I said, this picture was taken at 1.30 in the morning, and then for some reason the team came up with a tradition that after every deployment they would show their feet. I've asked why. I'm not <laughs> sure if MD actually knows. It was something somebody started doing and it sort of just stuck around. And then generally afterwards they would jump on and play some Rocket League or Call of Duty online to uncompress, and the cycle would repeat. But I will hand over to James now, and he will start talking through the design experience. Thanks, Pete. Um, so as Pete mentioned, there was already a, a quick site that had been stood up. Um, it was an MVP, it was functional, but it wasn't our definition of an MVP. Um, there was intuitive UX, lightweight functionality, on-brand design. There were some accessibility issues that needed to be dealt with, but there was accessibility issues were at the front of our mind throughout this, this whole project. The main thing that we wanted to do was make it easily extendable. As I've mentioned, content blocks uh, were the key to doing this, but we had to design and release very quickly. We weren't at a place where we could just remake the site the way we wanted to. We had to just keep going at it. So there was lots of deployments, once a day, twice a day in the early stages. Uh, if I go back and forward, the um, first thing that I had to design and we had to release was the alert banner. Now, this alert banner is hideous. Like, <laughs> I, did, I had literally 20 minutes to design this, and then the guys had to just develop it and get it out there. Like That red is not good. It's, nothing's aligned properly. But we were working at such speed, we just had to get things out and then realize that we could slowly refine those things. Um, this was after the first major release. You can see the header is now kind of what you've seen before. Um, the alert banner have changed the, the orange. It's slightly less hazard. Uh, and when we released this, we actually gave them the option to have different background colors depending on the alert level. Um, the other thing we've got here is search. There was people asking a lot of questions. And we've also begun to work on the information architecture. So we've, we've kind of segregated the content into different buckets. The content's getting larger every day. So we've, it's something that we we'll constantly have to look at. 
the next major release, we introduced this mega menu. So we wanted to be able to surface level two and level three pages because the content was getting bigger and bigger. Now, accessibility uh, learning point here is this menu shows on hover, but only shows after 0.5 seconds. Now, when you're using it, it looks like it's a bit laggy, but it's actually done so that people with slower motor skills don't get the menu flashing up uh, and obscuring the content. So it's, it's purposely done. And we had Jason Kiss from DIA working with us very intensively on this just to make sure that it was accessible as I possible. I think that was an interesting point. We, we took that approach that we actually had some Slack channels, and we had one just for accessibility. Yeah. So we'd have there, and as James were developing it, they would be getting feedback on some of the accessibility to make sure it was meeting all the standards. So we had all these like parallel streams going and trying to orchestrate them all together in that one day. Yeah, we had some great cadence. Um, what I want to talk about now, the, the site was multifaceted. There was all different kinds of content, mostly built using content blocks, as I said. Um, but it was very text heavy, very content heavy on some of the pages. So I had to do the best I could with topography alone. Um, we also introduced some jump links at the top of the page so people could skip down. I didn't press that. Um, but the, the content authors feared that there was just too much on the page. Um, we had to do content for different levels on one topic. So it got very long, and they feared that people would be overwhelmed. So we did what anyone should do in the situation, and we tested with real users. It was level four, so I had to conduct um, user testing via Zoom. It was a, a very strange experience. I did 10 in one evening. Uh, and among the questions I asked was, pointed out this page, what do you think about the content on this page? Is there too much? Would you prefer if it was in if the content was separated out across multiple pages or it was put into expandables. And 100% of the people said, no, we want all the content out because it's too valuable. We want to be able to read everything. Um, so we didn't change anything, but it was all, it's always good to be testing. Um, obviously, since then, we've built more and more content blocks. The content's been ever evolving, and we're still working at a lower lev level with them, with them now. So I'm going to pass over to Pete to talk about the next stage, which is fast follow. Thanks, James. So the next part of the process is a site that you've maybe got an MVP and you've delivered it, but you have some immediate work to do thereafter. So we've called this Fast Follow. Now, imagine your website's live or your, your, your features are live on your, on your site or your product, um, and you're happy with it. Generally, this might be a campaign is a good example, um, but there's a short piece of work that needs to happen thereafter. It could be quite discreet. It might be some security fixes. It might just be that extra feature. Uh, it might be a little bit polished. You know, you might have that transition you're just not quite happy with, and you want to go back and, and refine that a little bit. The key thing here is improving what you had before in a short space of time. So we're going to talk today around the work we did with DIA for Keep It Real Online. Now, I'm sure you've seen some of the campaigns around this. Um, but with lockdown came a big increase in internet use, especially for children. A lot of people were at home learning unsupervised for the first time, maybe having access to the internet. So the government recognized that they had to do a bit of work around this just to make sure people were informed, both parents and children. So we were approached by the Department of Internal Affairs to help them with their agency develop and design a website in a short period of time to get information out there. James. But the brand hadn't been finished. The campaign was still being filmed. And there was no written content. Um, and with all of the projects we're talking about today, that wasn't um, lack of insight from the initiative. It was just that everything happened at once. It, the, they were doing branding, campaign, marketing, content, website design, all at once. So in particular with this one, there was nothing they could really give me. So I said, OK, well, just, just send me what you've got. And they sent me this. <laughs> So this is, this is from the Department of Internal Affairs. So I'm kind of like, well, aren't you supposed to stop people sending porn? Like, you're actually <laughs> sending it to me. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, d I just didn't know what to do with this. Um, if you haven't seen the campaign, you should check them out. The, the videos went viral. It was featured on BBC and Guardian in, in England. In this particular scenario, um, two naked porn actors turn up to a, a kid's house because he's been watching them online, and they're there to kind of teach him that actually in real life it doesn't happen like that. Um, funnily enough, I was in Queenstown a couple of weeks ago, and I locked eyes with this hunk over, <laughs> over croissants and dried fruit. <laughs> I didn't know how to approach it now. I couldn't exactly say, are you that porn guy that turns up to people's houses? 
Um, so I left it. My wife was like, go and talk to him, talk to him. I'm like, I don't, this is really awkward. But you um, should have got the selfie because James messaged me and I said, you need to get a picture. It's going to be so good for this presentation because you can be like, this is the guy and this is me, but he didn't do it. Yeah, I stalked him. I stalked him afterwards. It was him. It was him. <laughs> um, so as I said, I literally had nothing to work with. So this is one of the most general wireframes you're ever going to see. Big, <laughs> big, catchy heading, page title. Um, I knew that, again, we wanted to use content blocks, so I'd already started separating out like that. I also knew that from what they told me, the content was going to be basically one level, um, but they wanted to use quite long descriptive titles. So you'll see here, the, the idea from this wireframe was the menu would be hidden behind a kind of full screen menu. This was the home page they went live with. Um, pretty basic, you know, there's calls to action there, it's showcasing the brand. Um, as I said, with the menu full screen, just very clear calls to actions for that, that one level of content. So this went out. This was, I think, three weeks, the turnaround for this one. Um, but straight away, as Pete said, with a fast follow, they wanted to add. They wanted to value add to what they already had very quickly. And what they wanted to do was maximize the reach um, of their content. So they wanted to take a two-tier approach. There was translating the content into multiple languages. And through their user testing, they also identified that there was two distinct audiences, which was adults and children. Um, so this was what we spun up in the next, in the following few weeks. So this is like a splash page you see before you get into the site. Um, you're able to select your language, and you can also choose your audience type. This was mainly for young people. The content was relevant, but initially it was written for adults, and they felt that they needed to write it in a different way to make it easier to understand. Once you've clicked through, this is an example of the parent section translated into Māori. Um, you can change your audience type at the top. I'm pointing down here, but you can't even see that. Um, and you can also change your language. Translating content uh, is a lengthy process, so we also took an MVP approach to that. Um, you can see here that if you go to a page and it's not yet been translated, a little message box appears in the language you've chosen just to say, hey, sorry, this page hasn't been translated yet. And it's just going to add in this, this level of finesse that shows the user that you know, you're working on it. It might not be ready yet, but we're going to get there. Now we're going to talk about continuously improving, Pete. Thanks, James. So we've talked around the first two examples were around you know, something needed really quick, um, and then something we've devel devel delivered quickly, but then we've done immediate work to follow up on. The final example is going to be around this continuously improving. So for this, think about you've got a longer time frame. Now, this doesn't mean you've got more people necessarily working on it and bigger budgets. You've just got a longer period of time to deliver the ongoing program of work. You might be following a more traditional agile approach, you know, doing your sprints and refinements. You're use heavily relying on your user data and metrics around pe how people are interacting with your product or, or your website. Again, you always want to improve on what you've done previously. So for this, we're going to talk around the work we did with connected.gov.nz. So if we think a little bit about the story arc around the examples we've talked around, we've got COVID-19, so it's a pandemic response. We've got Keep It Real Online, which is keeping people safe during a pandemic online. And Connected was the government's response to this from an economic perspective, making sure people that maybe have lost their jobs or are looking to retrain had a place to go. So we were approached in September by the Ministry of Social Development around this initiative. Now, of all, this, all the projects that we've talked around today, it was still in the very early stages. And then you add into the mix, there was an election fast approaching. And when there's an election, there's a whole bunch of rules about what the government and can, can and cannot announce. So a lot of things are getting worked on behind the scenes, but nobody can talk about it. But you've got a big program like this. There's physical regional centers in the country. There's multiple agencies, agencies involved feeding into MSD. Um, so that meant a lot of work to get the program off the ground. So when you think back to what I talked around at the start, around the communication, this is when it's really important. The more people that you've got involved, the more important your communication, your relationship, the tools that you use, because you need to keep everybody informed of what's happening. You also want to make sure you understand the goal. So if something is a little bit longer running, even though you've delivered an MVP, you want to make sure you keep in sight the goals of what you're trying to achieve throughout the project. Um, pass over to James, and he can sort of talk through the designs. Thanks, Pete. So I'm going to skip straight to what was launched, the home page. Um, you can see it's very simple. Again, it's focusing on 
on tiling, calls to action. Um, when we were designing this site, again, they weren't clear what exactly the content was going to be, so we had to try and keep it very open-ended. Um, skip, I don't know, one, one and a half months forward, and you can see how much the, the home page has actually changed. Um, I'll just go back so you can see that. So there's the, I'll just walk through the differences quickly. So one of the first things that they got feedback on was that the logo connected.gov.nz didn't have the authority enough of government. So they decided to dual brand the header. So just putting the NZ Gov logo alongside it was to, to help that. Uh, in the menu, in the navigation bar at the top, the um, menu button has become a lot more prominent. It was said early on that it was easily missed. Um, the biggest thing we've taken away is the search. So we gave them a search to begin with, but after a month's use, only about 5% of users were actually using the search bar. Um, this could be down to, to good UX, I don't know, or it could just be because people could just find what they were looking for. Um, but anyway, we decided to move the search bar out of the header and into the menu um, to leave more real estate for things that they wanted to add or that people were using. In this case, we've added a, a multi-translation toggle there as well. Um, because we've taken away search, we didn't want to take away the ability to kind of find those lower level pages straight away. So we added a popular topics section so they could use the search metrics, see what people are searching for, and then raise those pages up. I'm not pressing the button, yeah? Um, this is the menu, just to show you this is where the search went. Um, we also segregated the content a little bit similar to keep it real online, um, just so that the people from the different areas, so individuals, job seekers versus business and employers, could easily see um, the kind of links to what they were looking for. The biggest thing that we did post go live was uh, a tool called Explore Your Options. Now, this was talked about at the very beginning, but we always knew it wasn't going to be an MVP thing. People are coming to this site. They're often stressed. They might have lost their jobs. Um, they're not, they don't have the headspace um, to deal with a, a website sometimes. So we wanted to give them a way to navigate to the content that they need easily via just a, a few questions. This looks like your typical decision tree, but what we've actually done in the back end is we've tagged the entire site's contents with layers of categories and terms. Now, what happens when you select an answer here is that it's filtering the site's contents. The more answers and the more questions you get, the more granular the filtering becomes, uh, and the better results for the user. This is just an example of the results page. We're also currently working on regional content, um, so curating pages uh, for users geographically, just to add another, another method of navigation if that's their preferred way. So what does this all mean? Well, we've shared a few examples with you today um, about different ways we've approached the delivery of an MVP um, and the different ways you can see a, a site developing over time. But there's three points we'd like to leave you with. The first being build upon your MVP. It doesn't matter big, small, keep refining on it, keep making it better, and think about how you approach that. The second point is tailor your approach. Different circumstances, whether it be the project or the climate that you're working in, tailor your approach. Don't be boxed in with one way of doing things. Think about, can you use a different tool? Can you do Zoom interviews like James did and do them all on a Sunday afternoon when your dog's attacking you in front of people? You know, Think about it differently. It's a good icebreaker if nothing else. Um, and then finally, test and validate your assumptions. It's really important, and you've all probably worked with product owners who have an opinion about how something should work, but actually use some metrics. Think about how people are saying it. It could be anecdotal feedback you get from somebody. It could be from Google Analytics. It could be from a survey. But base your refinements on things that matter, things that real users who are using the site um, are actually um, telling you. And then one final point to leave you with. Even though you might have to sprint, design and build for a marathon. Thank you. Cheers.